Hey guys, um, my name is Ryan Green. I am the Western Regional Sales Manager for Shark Energy Systems. Uh, we are a unique company in which we take wastewater and put it to use uh, for opportunities for high efficiency air conditioning and cooling, as well as low carbon heating. So after this, hopefully one of the things that'll be clear is, you know, why wastewater in the first place? Um, what kind of municipal support has been um, kind of gaining around different areas? Um, some small scale opportunities that have, uh, have already gone in, gone in, as well as some large scale opportunities that have gone in. And, you know, really, uh, I'll sum it up with a, you know, an idea concept that I've got of, you know, what I think the the future American suburbs, um, you know, really could look like. So first off, what is the value of wastewater? Uh, we know there's a lot of it. We know it's virtually limitless, um, but you know, really what, what is a numerical quantitative value for it? Um, it turns out US Department of Energy estimated that over 350 billion kilowatt hours are discarded down the drains in the US on an annual basis. Um, so it's a whole lot of energy that's going down the drain, um, you know, putting into perspective, that's about 88 Hoover dams worth of energy going down the drain every single year. So that quickly frames the argument of why are we looking at wastewater in the first place? Um, it's, it's virtually limitless. We, we've got an almost endless supply of it flowing beneath our city streets already. Um, when we're taking energy from that thermal source, uh, we're able to he provide heating as well as hot water. Um, and then when we're rejecting energy into that thermal source, we're able to provide cooling and air conditioning for buildings. Um, because we're not burning fossil fuels or, or anything like that, we're dramatically reducing GHG emissions around the board. Um, and then um, all, these, uh, all the equipment that uh, ties into a wastewater heat recovery system is generally powered by electricity. So when we talk about the electrification and net zero movement and those types of things, um, wastewater heat recovery can really play a very large role in, in helping municipalities and you know, even individual bi business owners achieve their electrification and net zero goals in a cost effective manner. And then on the utility side of things, um, it, it can bring in a lot of ways to uh, reduce demand. So when, when we go to this type of equipment, the overall electric electricity consumption in kilowatt hours reduces. But uh, more importantly, on the utility side, uh, their kilowatt demand in their summer peak cooling can also see a, a large dramatic reduction, uh, which really helps frame the argument of future peaker plants and you know, battery power and you know, helps fit those things into the right place. So I'm up in Denver and uh, our local municipal water um, or wastewater company is Metro Wastewater. And they have been um, on board with the concept of wastewater heat recovery for about two years now, actually about three years now, since the beginning of some modeling for a large project. And since then, they've got uh, a live website and downloadable documents really just coming out and saying, hey, we support this idea. If you're within our service region, please give us a call because we're going to provide you a feasibility analysis, kind of showing where our wastewater lines are, rough flows, rough and rough heat available to see what we can do for your development. So they, they've really got on board with this as a way to align with uh, the city of Denver's 80 by 50 GHG emission reduction goals. Um, and it's really allowing um, the, the city and the area to attract developers that have each eco client, um, eco conscious clientele, you know, a, a different uh, type of clientele come to the area because of these types of developments. So, um, and then really when they, when they studied it, um, just the heat available in the wastewater alone was enough to, come to heat the cities of Arvada and Thornton in Colorado combined. So it's a tremendous amount of energy again that we have available. And uh, you know, there's, there's groups out there that are really unlocking that opportunity. Uh, secondly, also up in King County, Washington, uh, they've actually taken it a step further and recently in September 15th actually passed legislation that is an ordinance that relates to the sale of that energy in their wastewater line. So now anybody that uh, they've got three pilot projects coming up and those groups that connect to it um, are then billed at a, a $0.005 per ton rate. Um, so for every, you know, all the energy that they're either transferring to or from that wastewater line, uh, that wastewater utility then is able to not only monitor that, but also then open up a new revenue stream that can um, 
you know, become, you know, increase revenues overall for that utility. Uh, something else that we're seeing um, across the nation is um, so in January, uh, leading engineering firms across the nation put out the, put out an open letter to the industry saying um, MEP equipment manufacturers, this is what we want to see um, you guys produce so that we can help our clients achieve net zero in electrification. Um, and the word that was repeated over and over and over throughout it were heat pumps, heat pumps, heat pumps. Um, some that uh, particularly caught the wastewater heat recovery industry's um, attention were water to water domestic water domestic water heaters. Uh, so something that's going to take a water source and take energy from that and then produce potable domestic hot water in an energy efficient manner. And then secondly was simultaneous cooling heating machines. So what this is is a you know basically a heat pump that allows um, not only heating but also simultaneous cooling at the same time. So the cooling effect, you get a byproduct of basically free heat. So you're able to get your hot water and chilled water production at the same time. So when you're able to use these types of sources, you're getting much more efficient um, transition to electrification. So this is something that the engineers have kind of been pushing for. So as I kind of push forward here, some may not know what is a heat pump. So this is um, kind of an education lesson. I, um, I've talked frequently about ground source heat pumps in the past. So one of the big things about heat pumps is what are they? Um, so basically in the engineering world, there's the second law of thermodynamics. And what that says is that you've got your heat or energy cannot on its own pass from a colder region to a hotter region. So when your friend's sitting there saying, hey, you're letting the cold in, they're wrong, the heat is going out. So that's the only way that it can transfer that way unless you add work, which in this case in a heat pump is electric energy. Now, what if I told you they're actually all around us and you've probably already used a couple of them this morning? Your refrigerator and your refrigerated air. So your refrigerator works by taking the heat, you know, it may not seem like a lot, but the heat energy coming off your food transferring that to a refrigerant loop and then to the back or underside of your refrigerator, hence why those areas of refrigerator order is a little bit warmer than the other, because that's that transfer of energy from inside to out. And then your air conditioner is, you know, really the same thing. It's taking energy from it, warmer energy from inside your house and transferring that outdoors via uh, an outdoor condenser or that, that fan unit that you hear bang on, bang off. That's a nice visual, I think, for the average consumer to really yes. keep in mind that you know, this isn't like mind blowing technology, right? It's just, you know, moving one, one set of air to another. Um, but this is a nice little, I hope if anything, people remember this visual. Uh, so you've got different kinds of heat pumps. Um, there are air source heat pumps where you're transferring energy, like uh, Shelby came and said is from one indoor source to the outdoor source. So it really depends on whether you're in heating cooling mode, whether you're rejecting heat outside or taking heat from the outside. Um, really when you're breaking that down there, what that looks like is you've got your outside air interacting with the refrigerant loop, interacting with your inside air. So in heating, your refrigerant's absorbing the heat from the outside air and rejecting it to the inside. And then in cooling, you're just reversing that cycle and absorbing heat from the airstream indoors and rejecting it to the outside. Uh, you've also got uh, what are known as water source heat pumps. So the big difference here is instead of having an outdoor condenser, you've got um, a water loop that is then carrying that energy to or from the heat pump unit. So again, um, on the on the simplest side of things, you've got a water loop that's transferring refrigerant to air in heating mode. And then in cooling mode, you've got the opposite where the refrigerant's absorbing heat from that airstream from the water. Um, there are also water to water heat pumps, um, which is really no different than your water to air, except you're transferring heat energy to and from a, what I call a process water loop, which is like for radiant floors, radiant cooling, uh, snow melt, th those types of ac applications that you'd see in the HVAC world. So circling back to wastewater heat recovery. So what we'd see on a wastewater heat recovery heat pump is you've got raw wastewater transferring to refrigerant loop transferring to hot water loop. 
So as that refrigerant will absorb heat from the raw wastewater and then that heat gets rejected to another coil that creates your domestic hot water for your, for your building. So that's how we're able to really, you know, close that endless loop of just dumping energy down the drain on a building by building basis and, you know, capture that energy from the wastewater and then transfer that into an all electric and super highly efficient elect, um, domestic hot water source. That's a good little uh, reminder, flushing down our energy down the tubes. Yep, quite literally. So some of the smaller scale opportunities that we've seen out there, um, one was a hotel laundry retrofit in Banff, Canada. Um, it was, uh, they were, you know, kind of a remote location. So natural gas was never really an option for them. So we see that a lot in, in different mountain towns or, you know, Santa Fe, um, those types of areas. So here they were using propane. So they saved a tremendous amount of propane and also had dramatic reductions in their utility costs. Um, but the big, diff uh, big thing here is for any type of laundry where we're just rejecting heat into, you know, a, an existing trough and then collecting that. The, the opportunity to you know, pick that energy back up and then put it back into that, um, that laundry process is, is very large and um, really creates a, lot, a good opportunity for very super high, uh, high efficiency heating because that, uh, that source water that we're taking, that source wastewater is, is a warmer temperature. Uh, another project was in Boulder, Colorado, uh, about 37 unit multifamily apartment complex uh, it'll be commissioned later uh, here at the end of the year. Uh, it is 100% net zero, does have uh, a full photovoltaic system all that coats the roof. Nice. Um, the, uh, all the wastewater energy is captured from the building. Um, that uh, the piranha on, or the wastewater heat recovery heat pump captures about 90% of that domestic hot water, or oh. not captures it, but pr provides 90% of that domestic hot water for the building. Um, and then there's an electric resistance water heater that provides that kind of top up. So, um, in the, you know, no matter what year round, uh, they're anticipating a coefficient of performance of about 3.6. Uh, so putting that into perspective, um, 3.6 is actually about 360% energy efficient. Uh, so some would ask, you know, how do you get 360% energy efficient? And that's because for every one unit of electricity we're getting out in, we're putting out 3.6 units of heat energy to that domestic hot water loop. So wow. our, our device is making the energy coming in more efficient um, through the heat pump refrigeration process. So that's how we're getting more efficient. So when you're looking at electric resistance, you've got a COP of about one, or if you're looking at even your best natural gas condensing uh, water heater or furnace, you're looking at a COP of about 0.95. Uh, so the, the efficiency gain you're getting by going with this type of system is huge. Yeah, so um, this slide, Ryan, you know, for anyone in El Paso that's a builder, works with builders, uh, wants to be a builder, this is it. This is the future. Uh, it's not next year. It's now. It's actually been going on. So I really hope that uh, if anyone in El Paso that's related to the real estate or building industry, this is this can be done. It's being done. And this is a really good example, Ryan. Thank you. And really the net next slide just you know hits it home for the developers that are kind of pursuing that net zero design uh so one thing that you'll find um so even when th though this is in boulder the heating loads and um or the cooling loads are obviously relatively small but even the heating loads are you know smaller because of the construction of a net zero building because these buildings are so much better built um, have a lot less heat loss to them they require less on the space heating and cooling so what really becomes the driver of your energy load is the domestic hot water system. So the, that, bit, that becomes very important because on you know, a multifamily that may be three, four stories tall, you don't have infinite roof space to, hit, to achieve that net zero. So the goal is to have the lowest energy consumption possible so that you have to you know, can get as close to net zero given the roof space you've got. So um, when they were doing this, they ran an energy analysis and versus the three different options they could do for um, creating domestic hot water electrically. And the, you know, versus electric resistance, there's about a 32% reduction in the site energy use intensity, which is the, basically the energy use over, uh, divided by the square foot over the entire year. So um, that building became significantly more energy efficient over that time period 
but just by go, uh, not by going with the electric resistance. And then even the next most efficient option where they're running with a minimally compliant um, air source heat pump water heater, um, they were still 16% more efficient um, by going with the, the wastewater heat recovery heat pump. So that was a, a big driver there because this allowed them to truly achieve that net zero because they had so much less energy that they had to make up on the consumption side with solar panels on the roof. So this is really where a lot of developers will get caught up and say, well, net zero is not cost effective. And it's like, well, if you're using traditional air conditioning, heating, and you know, those types of technologies, I would agree with you. It, it can get very cost ineffective because the amount of solar that you're gonna have to need to overcome that you know, large energy use intensity on that site. So it, it's really imperative to run you know, energy models as well as you know, really looking at what's deriving that load uh, for that particular building, which in the case of multifamily, it's gonna be your domestic hot water because it's based on the occupancy and not based on the outdoor weather. That's actually a really good point, um, you know, especially because Ryan knows I'm a huge solar guy. I've been doing this for 14 years and he's the big geothermal guy. Um, and, and he's right, you know, sometimes you get on a roof and you can stack solar panels for days. Um, and a lot of times you can't, or it's so cost prohibitive to move everything um, that you sort of use what you can on the roof for solar. And this is when, you know, other technologies like geothermal really come in for older buildings that, that maybe don't, like you said, they don't have the rooftop space or there's shading issues or whatever. Um, this is sort of why I wanted you here today, because I think solar, like you always say, is always in the spotlight, but this is something that could be just as big or bigger. So. Absolutely. So, you know, really what's going on in that building is as that wastewater is leaving the building, there's a tank that captures that water, that wastewater. And as the building call, you know, people get up in the morning, six o'clock, everybody starts showering. It's going to call for domestic hot water and it's going to call for heat. Um, so that's when we're going to pump wastewater in, uh, into the heat pump water heater. And then that uh, process of, you know, the heat pump of transferring the energy from wastewater to, from refrigerant to the water, that's what's going on inside. And then that's when you're going to get the domestic hot water out to the apartments. And then as that temperature degrades inside the water heater, um, a valve opens, we, the water is rejected back out to your sanitary wastewater and the wastewater tank process starts all over again where we refresh with uh, warmer thermal energy. So it's a really good opportunity on your, your multifamily, um, hotel, um, senior living, those types of facilities where instead of just having the wastewater, you know, leave and throw all that thermal energy down the drain, uh, this, you know, provides a building by building level to capture that energy and, um, you know, put it back to use. Um, another thing that, you know, in this uh, post COVID world that we're going to be seeing a lot is, is contract tracing. You know, how, how are, how are we going to be best doing that? Um, so this, obviously we know that COVID can be traced through wastewater. So what this does on a building by building level is it allows the facilities engineer of that building to use that wastewater in that wet well as a testing sample, then to determine if that building has the, you know, the presence of COVID or really any virus in that wastewater, because this wastewater has not gone out to municipal sewer yet. So it's not mixed with any other building quite yet. So wow. it brings in that building by building level of, you know, providing access to contract tracing and say, hey, we've got this dormitory and guess what, we've got somebody that's got COVID. So, you know, it, it, it opens up a whole nother level of, you know, not only we're we providing, you know, energy efficient hot water and, you know, air conditioning to buildings, but we're providing potential testing points of, you know, locating, you know, viruses down the line. Wow. Uh, so before you go on, uh, A, I've never heard that. Um, it makes total sense because you've got the wastewater right there um, for contact tracing and isolating a building down and telling people, you know, that they could have it. I mean, that. That's amazing. That's the first time I've ever heard that. So that, that's a really cool takeaway, especially like you said, post COVID world almost makes you realize how dirty the world kind of was. <laughs> Everyone, people didn't wash their hands. People weren't sanitizing tables and doorknobs correctly. So, I mean, this is, this is really, really cool. I mean, every hospital, um, every nursing home should have this. I mean, this is amazing. So um, on to some of the larger, uh, larger scale opportunities that have done in uh, wastewater heat recovery. 
Uh, so one was a municipal water headquarters in uh, the eastern US. It was a 150,000 square foot class A office building. It achieved uh, LEED NC Platinum, as well as several other um, AIA awards. And, and the most interesting fact about it is actually before COVID, it had one of the most rented out wedding venues on its rooftop. Um, is just, you know, I guess spectacular views of the area it's in. And so on top of this municipal wait water headquarters was a rentable wedding venue that was, you know, doing really, really well. <laughs> you would, I definitely wouldn't have thought of that venue for my wedding. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely <laughs> wouldn't have. And, you know, the, the reasoning for it was actually pretty neat. And you, you, I think you'll enjoy this, Shelby, is they didn't want the additional costs of going this route to be pushed back on the ratepayers. Oh, wow. So the That's revenue cool. from the wedding venue is going to cover the incremental costs. Eco weddings. If you're a right. wedding planner. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so in that building, um, the wastewater heat recovery system consisted of a, a filtration unit and a heat exchanger. Um, and then, a, you know, a heat pump HVAC system that was providing that um, heating and cooling and domestic hot water for the building. So using this instead of traditional sources, they didn't have to have any boilers that were burning natural gas on site. Uh, they didn't have to have any evaporative fluid coolers that would be um, you know, evaporating millions of gallons of potable water, uh, requiring lots of chemical water treatment, requiring lots of maintenance. Uh, you know, when I came into this world um, selling Evapco cooling towers and learned very quickly that cooling towers, they work really well at scrubbing the air of everything. So they really become, you know, contaminated with all kinds of different things very quickly. So um, in the commercial world of HVAC, you know, anytime you can reduce or eliminate cooling towers and their usage is, is definitely um, really seen as a positive to, to most facility engineers I've ever spoken with. Uh, and then also, you know, mechanical room wise, you're also going to see a smaller footprint than you would see in, in most mechanical rooms uh, with, with traditional equipment. Uh, so the HVAC equipment actually used in the building um, was uh, one of what's known as a heat recovery chiller. So you'll see there it's got six different pipes. Um, one set of pipes is for what is known as the source, which would be in this case, the, the wastewater energy recovery system. Um, one is the hot water loop and then the other is the chilled water loop. So those hot water and chilled water loops are supplying what's next to it, which is uh, it's known as a chilled beam. So don't let the name fool you. It says chilled, but it can also provide heating. So your ventilation air um, from the unit on the far right there is called an outside air processing unit. So the ventilation air, you know, this is big in the COVID world. Um, your outside ventilation air is pre-processed by that unit, taken through MERV 13 filtration, and then entered into the space at a predetermined rate uh, set by the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, Air Conditioning Engineers. So that rate then, um, so the outside air comes in through that unit and in, and then that uh, air is either cooled or heated using the um, chilled water, hot water plant that you'll see there on your left. So. Every school needs this like today. <laughs> Man. I mean, th this will make a lot of parents feel more comfortable, whether you, you want to send your kids back or not, or even if like here in El Paso, we don't even have the option, I don't think right now, uh, because of our extremely high COVID cases and lack mm -hmm. of management by, by city leadership. So, I mean, but this is really cool that these things are sort of on the shelf and can be plug and play pretty quickly. I have a feeling there's gonna be a lot of retrofits in schools and nursing homes and office buildings pretty soon. This is I, very I, cool stuff. Thank you. I, I know in the HVAC world, the, the things I've been seeing, uh, particularly in indoor spaces is ventilation, filtration, and then the addition of some sort of, you know, uh, bipolar ionization, uh, combined with UV uh, technology can really be the ultimate test to, to get everything out of there. But some combination of those things are, you know, truly what I believe is going to be needed in the, the HVAC world for schools to, you know, mitigate the risks um, aligned with what's going on right now. Yeah, it's almost like you might have to go to school to get clean air, because I know in some places <laughs> in El Paso, uh, you're better off at school than in your home by a, a, a diesel bus stop or by the border uh, where all the 18 wheelers are backed up and just polluting those neighborhoods. Um, I mean, this, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. This is just oh, no. super, super cool, not only for air quality, but for all the COVID. You know, the, the, this uh, speaker series is focused on sustainability during a pandemic. So yeah, this is all, uh, 
it, it, I feel like your industry is going to be put in the spotlight here very quickly. It, more so than it has been. Definitely has been. That's that's for sure. And it, you know, and it rightfully should, you know, the, the ventilation standards and things like that need to be adhered to. And, you know, these technologies are definitely out there. And so, but not to get too sidetracked on indoor air quality as important as it is, as it's now. Uh, so these, so these systems did not change versus for all that. So it was a heat pump HVAC system, no matter which route they were going, it, they were just changing what was going to be providing the hot or the, the warm source and of heat or the heat rejection to that heat recovery chiller. So that's where they had either boiler towers or a ground source system or the wastewater heat recovery system. Uh, so they weighed all three of those options out. Uh, with the boiler tower, you've got your cooling tower that's rejecting heat during the summertime. Boilers are in injecting heat during the winter time. Um, it does have the lowest in first installed cost. Um, uh, but uh, one of the drawbacks to it is the uh, increased utility costs and potential high maintenance costs associated with it because of the uh, cooling tower and boiler maintenance. Um, and again, you know, kind of going back to the, the rooftop venue, they, were, they would lose the rooftop space to the, the boiler room and um, cooling tower room on the, spot, on the top. Um, so when they went to the ground coupled option, um, instead of having the cooling tower and boilers, you've got the underground uh, heat exchanger that's rejecting and injecting the heat. Um, there, they were going to be incur incurring some very high first costs just associated with the, the amount of drilling that would be required. Um, they did, you, know, you would see lower utility costs, uh, way lower maintenance costs, you would have no fresh water consumption, and you would preserve your space. But it was that first, uh, first cost uh, for a municipal utility that they could not get over. Uh, so what that did is the wastewater heat recovery system really gave them the best of both worlds. Um, it was about a 17% cost premium over uh, the water source system and uh, still provided the same low utility costs and low maintenance costs and uh, freshwater consumption um, preservation that you got from the ground coupled system as well. Uh, so when they, you know, we're really looking at that life cycle analysis. You know, again, it was 17% more than the water source, uh, but in your operating expenses, it was a 72% reduction in water source. So when we're talking operating expenses, we're not just talking utility. You know, that's your maintenance and your upkeep and, you know, everything that goes into operating that piece of equipment. Um, so this is where they really, really got that, uh, that sense of the, the wastewater heat recovery system was going to provide the best payback for them. And they were actually calculating a rough five year simple payback for the entire system. Um, and at the same time, we're able to eliminate 1,350 metric tons annually from, uh, for GHG emissions on site. Yeah, that that again, the, the five year payback and throwing in an ROI percentage in there for builders, I think that's what's going to get them, uh, especially if you pay 17% more, the savings is far more than that 17%. So yeah, if anyone again, is a builder and you're listening, um, especially in El Paso where water is a sacred resource. Um, yeah, this is all very relevant. And then one of the other big uh, things that I, I stress with anybody, so I'm, I'm over on the West Coast, so I cover, you know, California, Alaska, Oregon, Washington, multiple different areas. So I'm, I'm dealing with multiple different electric utilities. So, but each one of them has some sort of custom incentive program or peak kilowatt demand reduction program or some sort of thing like that, that you'll definitely want to take a look at um, when, when doing this life cycle analysis, because that can dramatically reduce first costs right out of the gate when you bring in those uh, utility incentives. Yeah, our electric utility, uh, if anyone is on from El Paso Electric, um, then the, what I think what you said is what everyone hears is peak demand reduction, which means less need for additional power plants, especially uh, dirty natural gas power plants. So yeah, that, that's peak demand reduction is huge. And again, water. Uh, so one of the other things that uh, really came out of that system is so your, your ground source systems or water source heat pump systems, they operate on a temperature range. And um, that range of temperatures um, is directly associated with the efficiency of that equipment. So the, 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 the less you can have that range vary, and you know, especially the, the more you can decrease its uh, relative low and high peaks, the more energy efficient that system is going to be. Uh, so that was one thing that really got out of the, uh, the system there on site too was, uh, you know, versus the ground where they had a 40 degree uh, delta between its peak and its low. Um, there was a, you know, a vast range of temperatures that that system would be seeing. And then 
for the cooling tower boiler is a little bit less of a delta. And then for the wastewater heat recovery system, it is even less. So that, that by shrinking that band, their system becomes that much more energy efficient. And the, the exponential increase of efficiency just by raising your, your, or raising your uh, water temperature in the wintertime or decreasing your water temperature in the summertime it, you know, has dramatic effects on that electric consumption and uh, peak electric demand as well. Um, another project in Denver, it will be the largest wastewater heat recovery system in North America, uh, providing about 3000 GPM total of wastewater flow. Uh, the total campus area is about 2.2 million square feet. And just from the wastewater flowing beneath it, about 90% of all heating, cooling, and hot water loads will be met. Um, so, um, and that was just using a very small percentage of the, the wastewater flow. So you could, you could get the sense that uh, really just kind of dipping their toes in the water to see you know, how, how effective this could be. Um, but then as you can see there on the rooftops, uh, there's about 11.4 to megawatts total of solar PV array around the entire campus as well. So this was really taking net zero to, to totally new heights and, and showing that it doesn't have to just be building by building and that it can actually be more cost effective when you do a campus or district style. Um, so looking at you know, your typical campuses, um, traditionally how they've done it is, is a building by building approach where they'd have a heating and cooling system by each building, um, may have a cooling tower if it's wa uh, water cooled, uh, you've got a separate system creating air conditioning and a separate system creating hot water and a se separate system creating heating. So it's, uh, you know, very clunky, lots of moving parts. And, um, you know, truly, in my opinion, one of the, it's a Cro-Magnon way of, of looking at um, district energy systems. Uh, so what they were doing here um, is instead having in what they call an ambient loop. So they say ambient because the water in that loop is roughly 75 to 85 degrees. So it's kind of an ambient neutral temperature. And that flows to each building on that campus. And then within each campus, there are water cooled heat pumps that are providing um, hot water, chilled water, or that air conditioning heating for that building. So now it's an all electrically powered heat pump. So they've got the PV array on top, powering all the all electric um, heat pump that's providing the air conditioning, hot water, and domestic hot water for the building. So you're no longer even having natural gas to the building. You can see that that green line was completely eliminated. And that was one of the big goals of this campus was to dramatically reduce natural gas consumption and actually eliminate the infrastructure where it could be. Uh, there were some areas um, for um, medical purposes and, and other things like that where they needed um, uh, natural gas to be existing, but most of the areas, it was definitely not being used for heating or hot water production on the entire campus. Uh, kind of get an idea of what they were, you know, building out total size wise, you've got all the different various uh, buildings that connect into uh, there you can see at the bottom the CUP is the central utility plant. So from there, all the um, ambient water is distributed out to each building. And then again, each building uh, connects to that and uh, it, it provides for heating and cooling for itself. And again, achieving that net zero at scale. Um, they looked at the, the total power consumption over the, the annual basis, and we're looking at exactly how much solar they could do based on the, the Excel net, uh, net metering rules. And um, as you can see, they were able to you know, really get that net zero power consumption um, or a net zero uh, possibility there with the amount of solar that they get on the rooftops. Yeah. Well, this is like a no brainer if it's a new building construction. I know it's a little harder to retrofit still worth it like this is i mean any residential uh or commercial or like a retail strip um yeah this is awesome and that's really what i kind of get into in the in the end is you know redefining the american suburb you know there's lots of places where there's uh master plan communities still going up large very very large small um but the idea of community geothermal or you know uh, com community thermal loops is really not new um, there's several places all around the United States um, that are already doing it. You've got Norton Commons in Kentucky with over 600 acres, uh, Whisper Valley in Austin with over 700 acres, uh, Serene Bay in uh, Georgia. They've all got these community geothermal loops, and you know it's, they, they've really kind of changed the face of you know residential development and how it can be eco-friendly and net zero friendly right out of the gate. 
Uh, but you know, these are all recent developments. You know, going back even as far as '97, there was the Fort Polk installation in Louisiana uh, had over 4,003 military units. Um, and one of the unique things here is um, you can see the dramatic energy and peak load reductions. Uh, but, but because of the peak load and load factor, they were actually able to negotiate with the utility a better rate structure because of the reduced demand that this would be bringing in versus a traditional air source system. So in your warmer climates, this becomes a negotiating tool with, again, you know, with your utility saying, hey, partner with us to build it this way, what we see is the right way, and we actually all achieve the same goals. We get the sustainability that we want, you guys get a summer peak load reduction, and your load factor improves. So it can really become powerful when you start talking about, you know, moving water through these, through, you know, water and thermal energy through pipes, as opposed to having individual air conditioning systems, building by building, home by home. Um, so, you know, really, you know, I think taking it a step further, you know, the community geothermal is amazing, um, but it does require, a, you know, lots of bore fields and, lot, you know, lots of drilling in the grounds. Uh, so what we're doing is replacing water pipe or replacing gas pipes with water pipes and, all these communities, all these homes that, you know, there's going to be schools, there's going to be recreation centers, there's going to be all the residential dwellings, all the homes, all, you know, potentially multifamily, maybe some hotels. The point is there's going to be a lot of wastewater flow. So why not take that wastewater flow, take that energy and reuse it and distribute it, you know, similar to the district energy si system in Denver. And then you've got all your homes that are interconnecting with that district loop, all your schools that are interconnecting with the district loop and all these different entities that have been interacting with that district loop so that, you know, you're no longer having to drill all the boreholes as your primary heating and cooling, but your geo loop then can provide, you know, for your peak cooling and peak heating conditions. And then if it's in a super cold or super hot climate, you can throw on a boiler or a potential cooling tower just for those very, very hot summer days where you may not be able to have that thermal energy transfer from your wastewater or your uh, geo loop conditions. Wow. Uh, so what are you getting out of that, out of that district system? Um, you're getting a lot of reliability. Um, it's been proven that district energy systems, um, they provide a, a much more reliable source of heating and cooling and hot water to their buildings. Uh, you see them all over Phoenix. Um, uh, here in Denver, there's a downtown district loop. Um, a lot of uh, downtowns already have these district, district loops in place. They just haven't been, you know, this ambient single pipe style but uh, the, the reliability and resiliency and efficiency of them ha has been proven year over year. Um, these ambient systems also then, you're, you're laying the ground roof for net zero. And again, these are all electric devices and machines that are connecting to it, so they can all be powered by solar wind battery. Um, the local wastewater utility in areas where um, you're gonna be taking a lot of heat from that wastewater, um, they, get, they actually get a benefit because they're removing that heat from the wastewater, which they're being penalized uh, by the EPA right now for having too warm of um, effluent te temperatures leaving the plant and then obviously going into our river streams and really? uh, oh. everything else. That's so an extremely good point. Wow. If you can find ways to remove that heat from the wastewater before it hits the plant, you can form these partnerships as we've done in Denver and King County to, to you know, benefit that local wastewater utility. Um, obviously, we're going to be supporting local sustainability goals. Um, we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're reducing energy consumption, we're being powered by solar, all these things align with your local sustainability goals. Um, Brian, more would, usable rooftop you, area. I have a question. Would you say that a yeah. lot of uh, people like yourself or developers, would you say they're almost always partnering with, with the water utility and on every single project from, from ground up? For, for our wastewater heat recovery systems, most definitely that because there will be eventually some tie in to the municipal wastewater utility that having some involvement with them would, would be, uh, I would say, considered absolutely crucial. Great. Yeah, because we definitely want to you know partner with El Paso Water Utility and make sure that there's open communication for any geothermal companies like yourself um, just to get the conversation started in El Paso. I know it started a long time ago and it died out, so <laughs> hopefully we can get that going again and put a spark behind it. So going back to the, you know, reducing the drilling requirements when we're, when we're using wastewater as the primary source and sink, um, that bore field becomes your secondary. So it's, it's a whole lot less uh, incremental for first costs uh, while achieving, you know, similar and or possibly better results from that, from the entire, uh, the system itself. Um, and one benefit to the owner of that loop field 
is it is also considered a hybrid geothermal system. So currently there are tax credits available for, uh, for geothermal systems. For residential, it's very similar to solar. It's a 26%, um, I believe it's capped at 9,000, uh, but there's a 26% uh, federal tax credit available for uh, residential geothermal systems currently. And then there are also um, uh, commercial credits that is a 10% uncapped um, tax credit for the commercial systems on there. So when you hybridize a geothermal system, you're able to still capture those tax credits on that loop field while um, still including the cost of that wastewater heat recovery system, the piping, the controls, the pumps, you know, all the different associated things that go into that system and make it work all become part of that commercial tax credit, which can become very, very, very valuable to that, uh, the developer owner of the building. Well, hey, on this slide before you move on, and, and I know I'm, you might be covering it, but just, to, you know, I'm a renewable solar guy, but I'm also a recruiter. And this visual, this photo, it, it almost seems like it's a really good transition as we move away from fossil fuels for anyone in the drilling industry and fracking to get out of that. And potentially they could take their drilling skills over to the geothermal side. Do you see that happening currently? Or do you think that that's a route to transition, you know, from dirty energy jobs to clean energy jobs? hundred percent. If you were to Google right now, um, geothermal oil and gas drillers, you would already see that that transition is happening and people are already doing that saying, Hey, we've got the rigs, we've got the skills. All we need is some different accreditations and some new training and we're ready to go. So it's definitely another avenue to transition away from your traditional oil and gas industry over to a, a clean industry while still doing the same thing that you've already known. Nice. Absolutely. So definitely you know, a, a very large job creation opportunity. Uh, one thing that has happened a lot on these community systems that it opens up is having third party ownership of that, uh, of the energy center. You know, so all the underground piping, the, the wastewater heat recovery system, uh, the geothermal bore field, all that stuff is owned by a third party entity. So what, what that does is it takes away the first costs from um, the low income community that might be c coming into this or you know, whatever is connecting into this uh, uh, energy center loop field. Uh, the, the first costs of going this energy efficient route are not borne by them. Um, so that energy developer then uh, takes on those first costs. They get to benefit from the tax credits. Um, and then again, going back to that Fort Polk example, they, you know, they then as, as an entity have that potential to um, negotiate with that local utility on different rate structures for that you know microgrid, if you will, community. And then all the users that are connected to that are are billed based on their usage of that thermal loop, which is you know very simple. There's uh, energy meters that are already commercially available, um, and the the site in front of your home would look nothing really nothing similar than your you know your gas or your water hookups that you would already see. So if somebody was not paying their bill per se, the owner of that thermal utility could come in very easily and basically shut off the water pipes to that building and you would no longer have heating and cooling. Um, and then again, everything is all electrically powered and compatible with solar, wind and battery there on that site. So you can uh, really quickly see how having a third party entity come in and own the energy you know, asset and then having entities hooked to that asset and then they're all powered by electric wind and solar, you've got a, you know, the potential for a microgrid in that area very, very quickly realized. Uh, these types of systems also, I think one of the big benefits is, you know, particularly uh, in the US, people like choice. They, they like the ability to be able to choose what they wanna put in their home or their building. Uh, so by going with this type of condenser water system and then having each individual home or building or school or whatever interconnect with it, you leave that choice with the homeowner on what type of HVAC and heating system they want in their home. So if they're used to that forced draft furnace, then they can go with your traditional water to air heat pumps. If they're looking for something like radiant heating or cooling, water to water heat pumps can be done. Um, if they like, um, you know, the, the uh, wall mounted um, mini split fan coils or the concealed look of VRF, they can go with a water source VRF system that, you know, provides the same exact benefits. Uh, really, this would be big in your older um, historical buildings where they may not have the space to run ductwork or piping. Um, they could be bringing this in as, you know, in a residential or a historical residential home, have this water source unit in the basement, and then have your concealed ductive units or wall mounted fan coils there in the spaces where they may not be able to drill into the historic site. Um, again, heat pump water heaters for your uh, domestic hot water 
and then your heat recovery chillers for you know your larger high-rise buildings that may be using uh, hydronic heating cooling systems uh, it really leaves that choice with the building owner so they're not restricted saying hey you've got to use this type of system if you connect to our loop because you know i think that would be a big hurdle to overcome so this you know keeps that choice open and you know really allows people to you know go with what they want and with that i will say thank you everyone really appreciate the time nice thank you ryan um you know if, if anyone does have any questions um we can sort of open it up um you know one at a time and we have ryan on the phone he you know he is from el paso he's a local who transplanted over to colorado and he is you know the geothermal expert that i always go to so if you do have questions now's your chance if not we can always you know you can email us at info at ecoelpaso.org and we'll get all your questions over to Ryan and he can interact with you as well as his contact information is on the page. He was kind enough to even give you a cell phone number and his email address. Um, so I highly recommend you take advantage of Ryan's expertise. If you wanna bring geothermal uh, you know, projects to El Paso, please get with Ryan, um, especially cause he is a local El Paso and we'd like to always pull him back here when we can. Um, but I will open it up. Any questions before we, we end the Zoom video today? Might have to come off a of mute. All right, well, um, I'll, I'll take that as a no at this current time. But again, you can email Ryan, you can email Eco El Paso. Uh, this is a part of our 13th annual conference here for Eco El Paso. We are an all volunteer nonprofit. Uh, so any donations you'd like to make um, are greatly appreciated. We give 100% of our donations back to the community in form of our projects, which include giving solar to nonprofits who own their buildings, uh, our Million Trees El Paso program, which will be uh, starting our first project here coming uh, the first week of November. Um, and then we've also got National Drive Electric Week. We started the chapter for the Rio Grande um, uh, Electric Auto Association. Um, and we have lots of events throughout the year. And then we always have our annual conference, but this year is virtual, it's free to the public. We are posting all these videos. So if you weren't able to make it today, um, the first three videos are already out there. I will be uploading this one later today to our website, to Facebook, and to all of the events pages as well. So don't worry if you or your friends didn't get to make the whole thing. We will have the whole recording on there. And like I said, please reach out to Ryan. Ryan, thank you. Your expertise is awesome. Uh, we love to have it. We're so thankful you always give back to El Paso. Um, and we will hopefully see you in person at the next year's conference. Awesome. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Shelby. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Take care.